In this video, we'll talk about the echelon form of a matrix. In the previous lecture, we talked about solving systems of linear equations, and one of the things we were talking about is how we take the augmented matrix for that system, and we want to try to put it in what we call the triangular form. But we weren't really precise about exactly what that meant, and so in this video we're going to talk about something called echelon form, which really makes that idea precise and gives us an idea of how to get the matrix into that form. So first of all, we'll talk about the word echelon. So echelon is a military term that's used to describe a particular formation. So in this picture, the planes are flying in echelon formation because each plane is forward and to the right of the plane behind it. We'll see this kind of formation when we start putting our matrices into this echelon form. Before we can get to the definition of echelon form, we need to define some terminology. So to figure out whether a matrix is in echelon form, we have to look at the leading entry of each row. So what does that mean? The leading entry of a row is simply the first non-zero entry as we go from left to right. So in this first row, as we go from left to right, the leading entry is this 8, which is actually all the way to the right of the row. In the second row, we get the leading entry right away. It's this negative 1. The third row doesn't have any non-zero entries, so it doesn't have a leading entry. And then finally, the fourth row, the leading entry is 3. So all the leading entry is is the first non-zero thing that you encounter, the first non-zero number, as you go from left to right in each row. Now here's the definition of echelon form. So a matrix is in echelon form if it satisfies these three conditions. The first condition is that any rows of all zeros have to be below any other rows. Now most of the matrices that you'll encounter won't have any rows of all zeros, but if you do have any, then they have to be below any other rows. Condition two is that each leading entry of a row, and we talked about that in the previous slide, each leading entry has to be in a column to the right of the leading entry in the row above it. And then finally, all entries in a column below a leading entry have to be all zeros. So here's a matrix. Let's check to see if it's in echelon form. Let's start by checking criterion number one. So are any rows of all zeros below any other rows? Well, in this case, we have a row of all zeros. Again, we won't always have any rows of all zeros, but if we do. So we have a row of all zeros, and it's not below all the other rows. In fact, there's another non-zero row below it, and so condition one is not satisfied. Let's just check the other conditions just to be sure. For condition number two, each leading entry of a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry and the row above it. That doesn't work either, because the leading entry in the first row is the 8, but the leading entry in the second row is in a column to the left of the 8, and so condition 2 also doesn't work. And then we already know this matrix isn't in echelon form, but just to practice, let's look in condition 3. All entries in a column below a leading entry are zeros. So that works for this first leading entry. Everything below that negative 1 is a 0, so check. This next leading entry in the fourth row there's nothing below it, and so that does satisfy the property. Everything below that column, uh, that leading entry, well, there isn't anything below it, so that checks as well. But it doesn't work for this last leading entry because we have something that's non-zero below that leading entry, and so condition three is also not satisfied. All right, let's try again. Let's try a different matrix. So again, we'll start with condition one. Any rows of all zeros have to be below any other rows. So again, this run does have a row of all zeros, but this time it is below all of the other rows, and so condition number one checks out. For condition number two, each leading entry of a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry in the row above it. So let's find the leading entries. That would be the three, this four, this negative four, and this six. Those are the first non-zero entries that we find as we go from left to right. So is each one in a column to the right of the leading entry and the row above it? And we see that it is. The 4 is to the right of the 3, the negative 4 is to the right of the 4, and the 6 is to the right of the negative 4. And you can see with those four circled numbers, we see that same kind of echelon formation that we saw with the planes in the earlier picture. So condition number 2 checks out as well. Let's look at condition 3. All entries in a column below a leading entry have to be zeros. Well, everything below this 3 is in fact a 0, so that checks. Everything below this 4 is a 0, so that checks. Everything below this negative 4 is a 0, check. Everything below this 6 is a 0, also check. So condition number 3 checks as well, and this matrix is in fact in echelon form. 
Now, just a quick note about condition three here. If you pay close attention here, it turns out that if conditions number one and number two, the zero rows always being at the bottom and the leading entries always going to the right of the leading entries in the rows above them, it turns out that condition number three is automatically satisfied. We don't actually ever have to worry about the zeros underneath the leading entries, assuming we have conditions number one and number two satisfied. However, we're going to leave condition number three on our list because it's useful to think about that condition in terms of the row operations that we're going to need to put the matrix into this form later on. So we don't want to get rid of condition number three because it's useful for us to think about how to get the matrix into this form. Now something else I want to talk about is what we call reduced echelon form. So echelon form is this precise definition of that thing we were calling triangular form earlier. There is another form that's also useful. Reduced echelon form is a little bit stricter. The criteria are a little bit uh, stricter to satisfy, but it's going to make it even easier to determine the solutions for the corresponding system of linear equations. Remember, our whole goal with all this matrix stuff is to allow us to solve systems of linear equations. And reduced echelon form is going to make it even easier to figure out what those solutions are. Okay, so what are the conditions for reduced echelon form? Well, it's the same first three conditions that we talked about. Conditions number one, two, and three here are the same as what we talked about before. But now we have two additional conditions, which we call conditions four and five. So for condition four, not only does the leading entry have to be non-zero, it actually has to be one. So the leading entry of each row has to be the number one. And then condition five, each leading one, each of those leading entries, has to be the only non-zero entry in its column. In other words, not only do we have to have zeros below the leading entry, we also have to have zeros above the leading entry. So the only non-zero thing in that column should be that one, that leading entry. So condition five overrides condition number three, right? So condition five is stronger than condition number three. So we really don't need condition three now when we're talking about reduced echelon form. But again, we'll leave it in here just to connect it back to the regular echelon form that we talked about. Okay, let's practice checking a matrix to see if it's in reduced echelon form. We'll check these criteria one at a time. So are any rows of zeros at the bottom of the matrix? In this case, yes, we have two rows of zeros, and both of them are below any other rows in the matrix. So condition one checks. Condition two, do the leading entries go down to the right? In other words, are those leading entries in that echelon formation? And the leading entries here are these three ones, and so they do, in fact, go down to the right. That's just another way of thinking about the idea that the leading entries has to be in a column to the right of the leading entries in the rows above them. So condition two, check. Condition three, are there zeros below the leading entries? Yes. If I look below these leading entries, everything in that column below those leading entries is, in fact, a zero. So condition three checks. For condition four, is every leading entry a one? Yes, we can see that very clearly, that each of those leading entries is a one. And then condition five says that we have to have zeros above and below. Well, we already checked below, so let's just check above. The first leading entry, there's nothing above it, so we don't have anything to check. The second leading entry, there's zeros above, and the third leading entry, there are zeros above. So condition five also checks out. So this matrix is in reduced echelon form. Now it's possible, and we're gonna talk about how to do this in the next lecture, but it's possible to transform a given matrix using row operations, if, if you recall those from the previous lecture, into many different echelon forms. There's not one unique echelon form for a matrix, but it turns out that there is one unique reduced echelon form for any given matrix. No matter how you get there, if you perform the row operations correctly, if you're working on a matrix and I'm working on the same matrix, eventually we'll end up with the same reduced echelon form, exactly the same, all the exact numbers in the exact same positions. So that's another advantage of reduced echelon form is this uniqueness idea. Okay, so what's next? So far we've just talked about what echelon form is and how to check to see if a matrix is in echelon form. So there's two big things that we still need to do. One is that we need to know how to transform a matrix from its original form into this echelon form or reduced echelon form. And then we need to understand why do we care about this? Why is echelon form important? And what do we do with the matrix once we get it into echelon form? So we will talk about both those things in the next two lecture videos.